Good afternoon, and welcome to our At Home Together webinar featuring Banner and B. Anderson Cancer Center's multidisciplinary program. I'm pleased to serve as your moderator for today's discussion. My name is uh, Dr. Madhav Akundranda. I'm a medical oncologist who specializes in gastrointestinal cancers and also serve as the chief for medical oncology, as well as being the director of the GI cancer program here at Banner MD Anderson. I'm privileged to be bringing the best of Banner Health right to where you are. Today, we are providing you a seat at the table for a behind the scenes look at how individual cancer cases are evaluated Banner MD Anderson. Multidisciplinary care is the hallmark of cancer care that's provided across our network. We have teams of specialists who focus on cancer treatment right from diagnosis through survivorship. And they not only include surgical oncology, medical oncology, and radiation oncology, but a whole slew of other specialists, including diagnostic radiologists, including oncology nurse navigators, genetic counselors, and uh, pathologists, case managers, and so on and so forth. A patient-centered approach to delivering care encourages a dialogue between, not just across the patient and the uh, physician or physician group or provider group, but across all disciplines to develop the absolute best treatment plan for you as a patient. The structure also provides this horizontal platform for research, including access to the latest clinical trials, which we know in cancer care is extremely important. Today, we're utilizing the gastrointestinal program to provide you with a snapshot of how a multidisciplinary team like ours works, almost creating what we call the patient's own medical think tank to develop this comprehensive care plan. We call these tumor board, uh, tumor board meetings. Today, you'll be witnessing a sample of three of these cases, unique in its own way, the first of which is a patient with stage four colon cancer in the management. The next one will be a young patient with rectal cancer, and the third being a pancreatic cancer patient. Although these cases are real cases, each requiring different specialists from different subspecialties, the presentation of the tumor board differs from the real thing in a couple of ways. Number one, the tumor board discussion can be quite lengthy. Since we're just here for about an hour, we're gonna provide a representative sampling of each of these cases, but include all of the key members within this process. The second, being mindful of uh, you all, our audience, and we try to extend possible to avoid going into much of the medical jargon or acronyms. So while the clin clinical information is accurate, I'll be narrating more than I, we would be having a discussion in a typical real multidisciplinary tumor board. One of the main things that we try to do for the benefit of our viewers today is to introduce the role of each specialist as I ask for their input so you know that you'll be hearing from our, right from our surgeons to our geneticists, for example. And finally, all of this is being done virtual. Unfortunately, like the rest of the world, previously at our tumor board discussions, these were live interactive events. And over the last year and a half, we have gotten pretty efficient in terms of running this virtually. However, still encompassing all of the components of a multidisciplinary approach that we do. That's the reason why today during the pandemic, we're still able to put together a virtual tumor board on this platform. I am truly honored and pleased to have three of my esteemed colleagues joining me today. Dr. Mike Choti, who is a hepatobiliary surgeon, but also the division chief of surgical oncology. Dr. Gary Walker, a radiation oncologist and also the chief for radiation oncology at Banner MD Anderson. And finally, Dr. John Chang, who is a radiologist by training, but the medical director of a body imaging. While you're watching, these, watching this today, consider the four of us being the core team, 
but knowing fully well that the input that you're going to be seeing is from a slew of other providers. Before we uh, get started, a couple of quick housekeeping items. You'll have the opportunity to continue to ask questions during the course of the program where you can send us these questions, and all of those will be addressed at the end of the program. Today's session is being recorded, so the audience is muted. But like I mentioned, you can submit your questions at any time. At the end of the program, after we are done with this, I will be moderating the Q&A session wherever. Well, I'm sorry, and the questions and whatever questions we're unable to get to at the event will be present on our resource web link. Let's join our first tumor board discussion. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for um, being present at our virtual uh, tumor board today. The first case that we'll be discussing is a patient with stage four colon cancer who presented at the age of 64 with rectal bleeding of about a year's duration. As is appropriate, the patient underwent an endoscopy or a, rather a colonoscopy, which identified a mass in the colon, in the left side of the colon, which is what we call the sigmoid colon. The biopsy confirmed this to be an adenocarcinoma, which is the most common form of uh, colon cancer that we typically see. As a part of the staging workup, a PET CT was performed, and this demonstrated that the disease had spread beyond the colon uh, into the liver, that rendering the patient to be stage four, and typically in, with stage four disease, it's uh, generally incurable, as would be the standard of care rather. The patient was started on systemic therapy with two different regimens due to toxicities that were spanned out over a span of, uh, from August of 2018 till about, um, Till about uh, July of 2019. The next slide, please. The patient uh, had a repeat PET CT, at which time there was no activity that was noted in the sigmoid colon, but there still continued to be persistent activity in the liver. In addition, the other thing that we look for with regards to response is a biochemical response or a cancer marker such as the CEA, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Next slide, please. Dr. Chang, from a diagnostic imaging standpoint, would you like to comment on these PET CTs that we have serially? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Kumbranda, for your introduction. What we are, have here is a commonly used technique that we call PET CT scan. And this is one modality that we commonly use to, assess, to evaluate whether or not the tumors are still alive. And we do so by testing whether or not the tumor takes up glucose. When it does so, it's very bright on the images. So on these, pan these images that we have into your upper left-hand corner, we have one showing the patient having undergone the chemotherapy, which has minimal uh, tumor on the image. Following some time uh, in the upper right-hand panel, you do see a bright red spot within that image, a single bright red spot that's there. And that is indicative of the tumor coming back and being a, a life tumor. Thank you, Dr. Chang. So and this is typically what we see, unfortunately, wherein the chemotherapy or any kind of systemic therapy controls it for a period of time. And then there is that presence or the recurrence of that disease that comes back. So uh, Dr. Sirocco, from um, your colorectal surgery perspective, so we have one spot in the liver, we have the sigmoid colon, would you like to comment from a surgical perspective? Yeah, so the question is, we have two areas of cancer, which should we approach first? The sigmoid colon, uh, which is, can often, uh, tumors in that area can often obstruct. This patient was not having as obstructive symptoms in a colonoscopy, the bowel was not obstructed. So therefore it made sense to proceed with a, uh, approaching the liver cancer first and leaving the primary intact, which is what was, which is what was done. Thank you, Dr. Sirocco. Um, Dr. Ramanathan, from a liver perspective, being a liver surgeon, what do you think, what options do we currently have for this patient? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Kondranda. 
So, you know, so as a surgical oncologist, we look at patients with metastatic disease whereby they've got cancer that's spread out of other places in their body. We try to think about the best treatment options we have, both to maximize quality of life, but also quantity of life. And we do that in a team-based approach. In this particular patient where the cancer has recurred in the liver, we have a few different options. The one option would be to remove just the part of the liver where the cancer has recurred. But a lot of times that tends to be somewhat short-lived because there are still cancer cells in other parts of the liver that are probably likely active. A lot of times those will show up again in the future just as this one spot did. One of the unique technologies and the unique medications that we have available at Banner MD Anderson is something called hepatic artery infusional pump placement. And what this is, is it's a special chemotherapy pump that goes directly into the liver and into the blood vessels that feed tumors directly. So what it allows us to do is it allows us to shower the chemotherapy into the liver at extremely high doses, thereby sparing a lot of the side effects of chemotherapy, but still getting very effective killing of cancer cells. And that's what we would recommend in this particular patient is to take out the cancer that we can see and then to shower the, can the liver with liver-directed therapy via a hepatic artery infusional pump so that we can try and control any cancer cells that we can't see and try to prevent this cancer from coming back as quickly and hopefully from coming back ever again. And the last thing I'd mention is the overall purpose of all of this. In a lot of different cancer types, we don't have the option to necessarily treat these metastases as aggressively. But because of the advances in colorectal cancer, we really have a unique opportunity here to have a patient like this live a long time, even though they have stage four colon cancer. And this is really one of the things that we address at our multidisciplinary team-based models. Thank you, Dr. Ramanathan. So this patient um, ended up uh, having the HAI pump. And as you can see in the lower left corner is the response that the patient had and then continue to have a response um, thereon. Next slide, please. So as we previously indicated, the CEA or the cancer marker was as high as 100. As you can see with this trend here that uh, on this graph, the patient CEA dropped, started increasing, then dropped again. And these were some breaks in therapy that we had for a multitude of reasons, but nevertheless, it's kind of plateaued out over the last few months. So next slide, please. So he had a PET CT, which was performed um, last month, at which time he had no activity in the liver. And he had a couple of areas of activity in the sigmoid colon. So Dr. Sirocco, from a colorectal perspective, at this point in time, with somebody who's got, who's very functional, wherein we've controlled the disease in the liver, what would uh, your thoughts be in terms of uh, surgery uh, to the primary tumor? Yeah, now that we've successfully managed the metastatic disease to the liver and the patient is, is off treatment, it's an appropriate time to approach the primary. There is activity on the PET scan and uh, we presume uh, residual disease within the sigmoid colon, uh, which is, hasn't been symptomatic, uh, but now would be a good time to approach that and remove it surgically. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Sirocco. Thank you. Now we will return to the panelists Great. Well, this is an interesting case. This first case, I think, is among one of the more interesting ones. It really is representative of, of colon cancer, one of the most common GI cancers. So I'm glad we selected this case as the first case for our, for our virtual tour board. Normally, colon cancer, we focus on early detection, screening, prevention. But this is one with stage four, which is interesting. And while many times we think stage four, it's already spread, this is a kind of an incurable situation, but stage four, still about 20, 25% of patients who develop colon cancer can develop stage four disease. And this is another area, as this, as this case illustrates, that having innovative, multidisciplinary, uh, aggressive approaches in some cases really can pay off. It's not a matter of just kind of giving chemo and, and stage kind of thing particularly when the metastases have spread to the liver, 
This is an area where multidisciplinary assessment, good imaging studies to see the number and location of the metastases, and often, as it was illustrated here, a combination of chemotherapy, surgical therapy, sometimes of the metastasis, surgical removal, we can ablate, we can surgically remove them, resection. In this case, very innovative strategy of, of delivering chemotherapy directly to the liver, high dose where the metastases are. So really, I think a, a case that's quite illustrative of the multidisciplinary uh, need for patients with GI cancer, and also very important that we maintain an innovative and an aggressive strategy. So fantastic case. Shall we move on to our next case? Yeah, can we move on to the next case, please? So continuing on with uh, the theme of um, colorectal cancer, this is a topic that's uh, close to a lot of us, either personally or within our um, immediate community as we see it, right? Which is rectal cancer in young adults. And in increasing presence and increasing incidence, I'm sorry, um, that we are seeing and for a multitude of reasons. So today I'm presenting a case of a 34 year old who presented with rectal bleeding for about a six month duration. And as we unfortunately see this, it's either neglected because it's thought to be from hemorrhoids because of the fact that it's presumed or assumed to be hemorrhoids. And then when they eventually get to a point wherein they get more symptomatic than just the rectal bleeding, they're present to their physician. In this case, um, she ended up having a mother with endometrial cancer in her 50s and a maternal grandfather with colon cancer as well. So her primary physician referred her to a gastroenterologist who very appropriately did a colonoscopy on a 34 year old with rectal bleeding, which just to be clear with the guidelines and all of that, when you have any rectal bleeding, the guidelines really don't hold in terms of the age uh, barrier. So that is something that we don't need to be concerned about to make sure that it's covered, so to speak. Um, in this case, um, a mass was noted about three centimeters in the rectum and was biopsy proven to be an adenocarcinoma, which again is one of the most common forms of colorectal cancer. So Jennifer, being a geneticist at uh, Banner MD Anderson, what are your thoughts about this? Patients got a, a family history, got a personal history of cancers, endometrial, colon, and, col and now rectal cancer. Yeah, so I think this would be a great candidate for genetic testing given her young age of diagnosis, which we consider to be any diagnosis under 50, and her family history of colon and uterine cancer. And so before we start with genetic testing, sometimes we'll do uh, a test called immunohistochemistry or IHC as a pre-screen for hereditary colon cancer. And IHC is a really quick test that looks um, at the colon tumor itself and looks for the expression of four proteins associated with Lynch syndrome, which is the most common form of hereditary colon cancer. If there's a loss of expression on those proteins, which means that those proteins aren't showing up on that test, it could mean there's something wrong with the gene that usually makes that protein. And about 20% of people with one of these abnormal IHC results, they will test positive for Lynch syndrome by a genetic test. Um, but even if IHC isn't done, or even if it comes back normal, in patients like this that are really young and have this significant family history, we still want to do genetic testing on them because she might have a hereditary risk for colon cancer in like a different gene, or she may have Lynch syndrome that's just not showing up on IHC. So this chart shows a list of the 47 different genes that we typically recommend ordering for this patient and what cancers can be associated with those genes. And from this chart, you can see that if the patient tested positive for one of these genes, we could use these results to see if she's at an increased for risk for other cancers in the future, like breast cancer or uterine cancer. And based on these results, we could recommend additional screening, like more frequent mammograms or kidney ultrasounds or upper endoscopies, or maybe preventative options like a hysterectomy. 
We also know these genes can get passed on 50% of the time to both men and women. So we could test her family members too and see if they have that same increased risk for cancer and could benefit from preventative measures. Um, so we were happy to see this patient in genetics and get that genetic testing process started for her in the hope that it can guide some of her future treatment. Thank you, Jennifer. I think this is excellent because what you're alluding to is the fact that it's not just from a therapeutic standpoint for the patient, but it's more from a standpoint of both a preventive think for the patient, even if the patient is, um, once the patient is cured, and uh, hopefully in this case, and also with regards to what it entails to her loved ones and her immediate family around her. So I think that is impactful because of the fact that um, this is just not about preventative measure or a therapeutic measure. It's a combination of all of that. And I think that's why at Banner MD Anderson, I think this is extremely important that Almost all of our patients get pre-screened to come and see you and the rest of the genetic counselors as and when is appropriate. So thank you for that. As a part of the workup, just moving away from genetics, but a part of the workup for this patient, she ended up having an uh, MRI of the MRI. And Dr. Chang, uh, from a diagnostic imaging standpoint, would you like to comment on that? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Jonah, for, the, for this case. Um, what we are seeing is a totally different modality than what you have seen. What you have seen in the last last case, as you can see, this the images are totally different. Uh, MRI is a technique that use that does not use radiation, so it does not induce any uh, any uh, genetic any uh, DNA defect on the modality itself. And in fact, MRI has such contrast between the soft tissue that it has become the modality of choice, not only just to evaluate for rectal cancer, but also for prostate cancer as well. As you have heard that uh, MRI is one modality that we use to stage rectal cancer here at Banner and the Anderson Cancer Center. For this case, uh, to your left is patient's front and to your right is patient's back. In her rectum, we do see a thickening of the front wall of the rectum, which is a growth. And in this case, there is a small bright spot of, the, of this tumor along the front wall that goes beyond the <clears throat> different layers of the rectum so that this mass or this growth has gone into the fat around the, around the rectum. So based on all these imaging, what this would suggest is that the patient has a T3 tumor and elsewhere, and uh, we're here we're going to have to ask for your trust, is that there is no uh, lymph nodes that are enlarged so that the patient would have an N0 tumor, uh, N0 disease. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Chang. So, Dr. Sirocco, in a situation such as this, young woman with what we would call locally advanced rectal cancer, what, from a colorectal surgical perspective, what would your thoughts be in terms of her management? So cancer like this in the rectum, we treat differently from colon cancer, which we would remove up front. For rectal cancer, we choose to do chemoradiation to shrink the tumor, which improves the survival and local control uh, with shrinkage of tumor and allows us to avoid a permanent colostomy in many cases uh, with good response. In fact, in the US, uh, a patient with rectal cancer is more likely to survive that cancer than a patient with colon cancer. So we've made great strides in, in improving outcomes with upfront chemoradiation. Um, and in a, in a patient like this, she would certainly be a candidate for sphincter preservation. The tumor is at three centimeters uh, from the uh, anus. That's at the limits of surgical removal, uh, but allow uh, uh, surgical removal with reconstruction of the GI tract with, with good response to treatment. So, uh, this is somebody that we could completely remove the rectum and bring the colon down and attach to the anus, uh, so-called coloanal anastomosis, which could provide both cure and avoiding a permanent colostomy. Thank you, Dr. Sirocco. I think that kind of uh, is where we're going with regards to this, because organ preservation, especially in young patients, we can cure them off the disease. But nevertheless, I think um, the quality of life and all of that comes with organ preservation. And uh, Dr. Walker, uh, from a radiation oncology perspective, 
in a patient such as this, right? Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of, I mean, most of them are working, most of them um, want to continue to have the same quality of life, right? So how can we ensure or at least attempt to give them the best quality of life, but still ensure that we get the best oncological outcome? So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you. So traditionally, radiation therapy is done with daily treatments. For rectal cancer, we traditionally did it over five and a half weeks, so 28 treatments with a chemotherapy pill. More recently, there's been good data uh, from Europe showing that we can do a very effective treatment with similar efficacy and toxicity in just one week of treatment. And so we're one of the few centers in, in Arizona that offer that treatment routinely. Um, for this patient, however, because the cancer is coming so close to the sphincter, we want to give the patient the best shot of having the, the sphincter preserved and having long-term bowel function. And so I would recommend the standard five and a half weeks of treatment for this patient. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Lastly, uh, Dr. Choti, any last thoughts with regards to this, especially with regards to a young woman uh, in the childbearing age? Yes, Mari, great. Thank you for asking me. First of all, yeah, this is a good example of management of rectal cancer. Truly, it's a multidisciplinary team approach up front in order to get the best uh, curative outcome, best function, and so forth. This is particularly interesting in this young patient, 34 years old, who may have this hereditary form, it sounds like. We don't have the genetic test back yet, but this is a patient where I do think fertility and, and risk of cancer is important. So this may be a patient, for example, who's, if she's still interested in childbearing, there may be an opportunity prior to radiation therapy to actually move the ovaries, laparoscopically move the ovaries out of the pelvis to protect them from radiation in order to maintain fertility. And similarly, on the other side, particularly if she's not interested in childbearing, this may be a patient who has hereditary risk of ovarian cancer, as you've heard from Jennifer, and this may be something to counsel her with regard to whether there may be some opportunities to add, to include a prophylactic component, for example, removal of the ovaries during the time of the rectal surgery. So those are all factors to think about when we really think about a multidisciplinary approach to a young patient with rectal cancer. Thank you, Dr. Choti. I think this just, uh, again, to not sound like a broken record, but I think this truly is where multidisciplinary care and multidisciplinary um, tumor planning care comes into play. And I, I, and we do it on a day-to-day -day basis here at Banner MD Anderson. I think sometimes we take it for granted. But this is where I think almost every part of this spectrum is uh, touched upon. So thank you so much, Dr. Choti and the rest of the team. And now we'll return this to the panelists. Welcome back. So again, we had a great discussion in this young patient, taking into account many factors, fertility, desire to avoid permanent colostomy, et cetera. So this next case is unique because um, it is a, can a patient with pancreas cancer as opposed to colo colorectal cancer. And I'd like to draw your attention to the addition of a GI pathologist, a dietitian, and a nurse navigator who helped in developing this patient's treatment plan. Let's uh, move on to the next case, which is uh, pancreatic cancer, which I know is certainly one of those wherein we had the pancreatic run in Phoenix uh, just last week. So this is one of those wherein it touches people from all over the spectrum. And wanted to um, chat about
Looks like we're having a little technical difficulties. Here we go. Let's uh, move on to the next case, which is uh, pancreatic cancer, which I know is certainly one of those wherein we had the pancreatic run in Phoenix uh, just last week. So this is one of those wherein We apologize. Yeah, it looks like we are still continuing to have some technical difficulties. So we'll just sit tight while we fix that. Love technology when it works. Right, so. Dr. Kendrana, should we answer one of these questions that we're getting? Yeah, I think that probably is a great idea, Dr. Walker. So one of the questions that has come through is, how often do you see young patients with colorectal cancer and what's been done to improve early detection? Um, Dr. Choti, do you want to take a stab at that? Dr. Choti, your mic is muted. Yeah, so thank, thank you, Marty. The, you know, colorectal cancer, it's a great question. The colorectal cancer is still, as I mentioned, common disease, uh, one of the most common malignancies in the US, still more common in older folks, but we really don't understand why, but we are seeing it in younger and younger patients. So that is pivoting a little bit in, in a variety of things. One is emphasis emphasis on earlier recognition of symptoms. It's that even that young patient who has change in GI symptoms, blood in the stool, not something to just kind of attribute to some benign problem, but still think about assessment, colonoscopy and so forth. And even more recently, the guidelines, you know, the the ASCO and NCCN, everything, the guidelines were always start screening in an average risk patient at 50. Now there's discussion about moving them down to 45 and even 40 in some cases. So yeah, we don't really know the reasons. It could be the microbiome, diet, other factors. We really don't know, but certainly it is, it is we're seeing them in, in younger patients, certainly in our center here more and more. And so all these factors, fertility and Colostomy and all those always important, but particularly gets becomes more important in, in from a quality of life standpoint in the young patients. Thank you, Dr. Choti. I think yeah, the quality of life is certainly um, a key part of this. While we're trying to cure our patients, and whether it's the young patients or the older patients, but also with the younger patients, it's more since they're in the childbearing age, plus they have they continue to work. Uh, that becomes extremely important. So it looks like we figured out our technical. Let's uh, move on to the next case, which is uh, pancreatic cancer, which I know is certainly one of those wherein we had the pancreatic run in Phoenix uh, just last week. So this is one of those wherein it touches people from all over the spectrum. And wanted to um, chat about this in the context of this patient who ended up having jaundice with a 40 pound weight loss and back pain. Some of these symptoms are very nonspecific, but also when you have symptoms that are more persistent, that's when I think it's important for us to recognize that uh, it's brought to the attention of your healthcare provider whether it's your APP or your nurse practitioner, whether it's your PCP office or the like. In this case, um, this was uh, brought to the PCP's attention and very appropriately, the PCP ordered a CT scan. And Dr. Chang, from a radiology perspective, would you like uh, to uh, describe this? Uh, absolutely, thank you, Dr. Kundrana, for introduction of this case. This is a CT scan which was obtained through the patient and this image that's displayed before you is an image that is cut straight across your abdomen. This allows us to see the organs inside and right in the middle of this image is the pancreas. And in the middle of the image, you're, you're, you will see two white rounded spots. Those are the vessels that are important in pancreatic cancer and that contains contrast, which helps us to see the different organs and as you can compare between this, this case and also the first case. On the image, it shows a very ill-defined uh, growth in the head of the pancreas, 
which extends outside of the pancreas itself to, uh, to involve the, the superior mesenteric artery, which is the rounded white spot along the bottom of the image that is critical for this diagnosis and also for staging. This growth also extends to light slightly outside and to abut the SMV, which is the superior mesenteric vein, the spot that is located anteriorly. Together, this would suggest that the, the cancer has uh, is borderline receptable and that elsewhere we have no uh, findings to suggest uh, metastasis in the liver or in the abdomen. Thank you, Dr. Chang. So this is a case that uh, seems to be uh, confined to the pancreas and certainly one of those wherein we need to have a tissue diagnosis. So Dr. Gao, would you uh, like to comment on that? Thank you, Dr. Kanchanda. Sure. Here is the pathology of the lesion. On the slides, you see the circular structures. They are called uh, glands. The cells lining the glands, they are called uh, epithelial cells. The cells surrounding the glands, they are called uh, stromal cells. Cancer arising from the epithelial cells are called carcinoma. If they form glands, we call it adenocarcinoma. Cancer arising from the stromal cells are called a sarcoma, which is uh, relatively uncommon. The normal glands are regular in shape. The epithelial cells are uniform in size. Here, the glands are irregular in shape. The epithelial cells are variable in size. There are also single epithelial cells invade into the stroma. Really unfortunate, this is a adenocarcinoma. Thank you, Dr. Gao. So this is the most common form of pancreatic cancer that we see in more than 90% of the cases. Dr. Choti, uh, from a surgical perspective, we got labs on this patient and uh, CA99, the normal levels are less than 40. Um, this is about 1500. Uh, as Dr. Chang alluded to us, there is no evidence of spread of cancer elsewhere. But the whole vasculature involvement is something that we obviously need to be cognizant of. And can you please uh, allude to that and uh, tell us what you think from a surgical perspective as the next steps here? Yeah, thank you, Madi. This is an example of classic presentation of pancreatic cancer. Unfortunately, the incidence is going up and it's candidly one of the most deadly forms of cancers that we see. Fortunately here, as was described by Dr. Chang, it looks apparently contained in the area of the pancreas, in the head of the pancreas. So this looks potentially removable and therefore potentially curable by, in this case, a Whipple operation, which is removal of that part of the pancreas. As is typically recommended, any pancreatic adenocarcinoma, we don't just recommend surgery and taking it out, but a multi-modality, multidisciplinary management, just like you heard with some of our other cases, where we typically recommend chemotherapy, sometimes radiation therapy, and hopefully coming to surgery. In this case, as you mentioned, in pancreatic cancer, where, it's, where it looks like it's up against some of those vital arteries and veins, this is the so-called borderline removable. These are ones where going to surgery is, can be challenging to leave a positive margin or need to injure or, or remove those main arteries and veins. My recommendation here is starting with chemotherapy, hopefully shrink the cancer, rescan, and then this is one of those cases in pancreatic cancer where we often may consider radiation therapy after in order to shrink it even more to really have it hopefully come off of those arteries and veins and then proceed to surgical therapy, which is really the, the definitive approach to try to get rid of this, which is surgical removal. So that would be my recommendation. Chemotherapy, rescan, get our, our teams involved, put, consider strongly radiation therapy in this particular case, and then hopefully come to surgery. Thank you, Dr. Choti. Um, so the thing is, patients always want to know what the next steps are, right? Obviously, we start with chemotherapy, and unfortunately, if the patient progresses or if the cancer gets worse and it spreads elsewhere, it's a different story. For a moment, let's assume that that's not going to be the case in this patient. So this is where I would like Dr. Walker to just comment on, um, like, uh, I mean, on the same lines as what Dr. Choti alluded to, 
what are your thoughts from a radiation oncology perspective uh, in somebody that's locally advanced, we get a good response with chemotherapy, but then radiation before uh, surgery. Yeah, so we know that radiation therapy can be done in a variety of ways in a patient with pancreas cancer. We have options all the way from one week of treatment all the way up to five and a half weeks of treatment. Uh, it really depends on where the tumor is in relation to the normal tissue around it, including the stomach and the intestines. In a patient like this, radiation therapy can help the tumor shrink away from those vessels in order to make the surgery more successful, more chance of getting all of the tumor out at the time of surgery. So that's a, a multidisciplinary discussion that we have, not just in isolation with myself, but the whole team gets back together, looks at the case carefully, and decides if, if we think that the radiation is gonna be helpful for that individual patient. So that's why it's so important to have the whole team involved and not just one specialty in isolation, uh, but all of us together deciding these things. Thank you, Dr. Walker. And I think, um... This is where I think when we talk about multidisciplinary care, right? Surgeonc, medonc, radonc, uh, we use these terms very loosely, but that is just one cornerstone of cancer care at this point in time. One of the most integral parts of this, right? You could do everything to nauseam and get the best oncological, um, radiological response and biochemical response. But the thing is if the patient isn't really fit for surgery, then the patient isn't going to go in for surgery. Like Dr. Uh, Choti alluded to, that is going to be the final thing to ensure that the patient is potentially cured of this disease. So that's where getting our dietitians in the loop very early on makes sense. And this is where I would love for you, Nicole, to give me your thoughts in terms of this 40 uh, pound weight loss and what do we do with these patients? Yeah, so we work with the patient to optimize their nutrition status. So some of the things we look at is appetite stimulants, placing the patient on a high calorie, high protein diet to reverse that weight loss. Um, we do that specific to what their likes and needs are. We'll also monitor this patient for pancreatic insufficiency. So this patient's already had a 40 pound weight loss. We check if they have symptoms such as gas, bloating, loose and oily stools, which can literally be fat malabsorption, cramping, belching. If they have any of these symptoms, we will be dosing them on pancreatic enzymes, and then that will prevent any further malabsorption. So with that, they're also going to be doing chemotherapy and radiation treatment. So we need to make sure we're managing their symptoms throughout this to make sure that they're eating well and preparing themselves for surgery. So once they get to the surgery stage, we make sure that we're giving them immunonutrition drinks. We also give them a carbohydrate loading drink the day of surgery. And then we minimize any further weight loss or risk of malnutrition as they go into their surgery to really make sure their outcomes are the greatest. Thank you, Nicole. So what we're looking at, just taking care of patients are not a number, right? So this comprehensive uh, approach to patient care, one of the things is having an RN who understands what the nursing part of it is but can still navigate through some of these barriers of care. And this is where Sharon works with all of our patients. And Sharon, in a patient such as this, what are the things that you're looking at when you meet up with them for the first time uh, at the initial consults, whether it's in Dr. Choti's clinic, Walker's clinic, or my clinic? So when the patients first come into clinic, I, my first appointment, my first meeting with them, I try to do an assessment to identify any type of barriers to care and uh, uh, in order to, to see where their needs are. That can be insurance, financial, so, psychosocial, cultural, or demographical. A lot of times patients come from a distance. They can be, uh, their transportation can be an issue for them, as well as uh, where to stay once they get here. We can also provide them with uh, opportunities with, within hotels or even uh, rentals in the area. I can provide them with resources if there are financial needs, uh, as far as anything may, that may be internal or external grants or foundations. 
um, and then other community resources that might help them as far as any type of uh, assistance, which could be uh, food or um, utilities, things of that nature that uh, makes a, a significant difference uh, for the patient. Um, part of my assessment also includes identifying their support system. So when assistance is needed, whether after a test to go home to have someone to care for them or even simply transportation home from those things, um, knowing ahead of time who, is, who that person's gonna be for them. And if there is no, no one available, then we help to uh, assess that need and, and take care of it beforehand. So we don't have to do that at last minute. Uh, the treatment plan we're looking at for this particular patient would include multiple providers between medical oncology, surgery, and radiation therapy. And with that come a lot of appointments that can be overwhelming for a patient. So I try to uh, go over that in, in phases with them so that they can um, prepare to, the, for their transportation for those appointments and help them to realize that, you know, even though they have multiple appointments on one given day, they might not need to, uh, it, one will follow the other, so they don't have to be, it's not as overwhelming for them. Um, during any point of their treatment here at MD Anderson, these things can change. And if those things, if things do change for them, I can be there to help them with any type of support at home with home health or even medical equipment if needed. Patients always have my number so that they're able to uh, get, you know, get a hold of me should they need to. And, um, you know, they have a, a contact here so that when they call, they're, they're able to speak with a person directly. Thank you, Sharon. I think this truly epitomizes multidisciplinary care. And, uh, and I think, um, you no, know, thank you for that because I think just with everything that we're trying to do, it's truly trying to treat the person as a whole and not just the disease per se. With that being said, I'm um, gonna pass this on to the uh, panelist group. Welcome back. Um, hopefully you have a whirlwind of what we do at our cancer center. But specifically in this last case presentation, um, you saw a very detailed discussion of significant key issues related to pancreatic cancer. As you saw, treatment of pancreatic cancer is complex, going from whether the disease could be taken out without residual disease remaining, and to whether or not the patient can actually withstand the treatment. Complete removal of tumor is key because surgery, as far as we know, is the only cure to date. And the best outcome that we can achieve through surgery is when the tumor is small. Yeah, but in this case, you saw how larger tumors could actually be be decreased inside, could actually be shrinked with um, radiation therapy to help the patient achieve complete surgery. Now, determining the, and maximizing whether the disease can be removed requires interaction between the surgeon, the oncologist, and also the radiologist. The next key issue that you saw was whether or not the patient is fit for chemotherapy and also for surgery. Chemotherapy itself is very taxing on the patient. And to improve patient's outcome, this requires interaction between the medical oncologist and the nutritionist. Lastly, the coordination of the complex care also requires the assistance of a coordinator. As you saw in this last case, the treatment of pancreatic cancer requires a team-based approach to achieve the best possible outcome for the patient. Back to you, Dr. Kundanda. Thank you, Dr. Chang. And thank you all for, so that wraps up our cases. I know we have about um, 11 minutes or so, and we have a lot of questions coming through. Um, so thank you very much uh, for participating at our uh, first at-home virtual program featuring Banner MD Anderson's GI Cancer Program. I certainly hope um, that you found this interesting and enjoyed a seat at the table for, to have almost a quasi behind the scenes look at how we evaluate and treat patients here at the Cancer Center. As a reminder, a recording of the participation, of the, I'm sorry, the presentation will be available at our resource website, along with other cancer resources as well. In addition, we'll also follow up with an email to all of the registered attendees, and we'll provide you a link. Kindly feel free to share that information. Now for the last uh, 10 minutes or so, 
I'd like to um, address some of the questions that were asked and please continue to um, use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to provide us with questions and I will try to direct it to the appropriate um, position here. Uh, before we get to the Q&A portion of this um, event, I'd like to just make a comment in terms of how important philanthropy is for the work that we do at Van MBM. We, as most of you are aware, are a non-for-profit organization, which invests all of its proceeds back into providing and building and growing programs and services for our patients. Donations do allow us to really advance um, care, whether it's cancer research or whether it's financial assistance, like Sharon alluded to, and also build these excellent uh, programs of excellence and enhance our ability to offer patients and their families the support system while you're fighting cancer. I know a lot of our listeners today have already been supporters of Banner and B. Anderson, and I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you. Um, in, thank you in terms of Devla helping us continue to advance science and help our patients. Please know how grateful we are as physicians and the clinical team and the leadership here at Banner and B. Anderson. Lastly, uh, before we get to the questions on the resource um, web page, there's a link to donate to Banner MD Anderson, and we invite you to join us in this important work. The support from corporations or foundations or individual donors do help us to provide this patient access in the most scientific, uh, scientifically promising way to offer these treatment options and address the most pressing challenges in the field of oncology today. So thank you for that. With that being said, let's um, get to, we have a lot of questions to get to. We will attempt to get to as many of those uh, as we can right now. And the remainder will be posted on our website. So let me get to the first question. So it says, is the, and I'll probably take that, is the increase of colon cancer in young people related to poor diet? All young people at my work live on fast food. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And um, we know um, that is red meat and processed meat are risk factors, and we do know that. However, it's just not the diet alone, but it's almost a multi, um, it's, it's, it's multiple factors that play a role taking aside the genetics part of it. With that being said, certainly maintaining a balanced diet is integrally important for us just for our well-being per se, not just colon cancer, but just for our well-being uh, uh, per se. Another question that seems to be a, a pattern that seems to be going on is, um, is why are the, uh, and I, I'll direct this to you, Dr. Choti, in terms of the poor outcome in patients with pancreatic cancer. Do you mind commenting on that, Dr. Choti? Comment on what's the specific question? Why the, why the outcome is poor in pancreatic cancer? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. It's a, it's, um, it's a, one of the most uh, lethal cancers we have a combination, I think, of aggressive biology and also failure to early detect. You know, the um, colon cancer, for example, not only can you detect early with screening colonoscopy, but actually the pre-malignant polyp can be taken out and actually prevent it. Even the mammography and other forms of screening, we don't have good screening tools for pancreas cancer. And by the time symptoms develop, it's often spread. 50% of patients with pancreatic adenocarcinoma, it's already stage four. So difficult problem. And so a lot of research, including in our, in our center, MD Anderson, Houston, others are looking at better screening tools, looking at circulating tumor DNA and other things for screening tests for pancreas cancer imaging. Dr. Chang is doing some fascinating research on looking at artificial intelligence to try to look at imaging to detect pancreas cancer earlier. So hopefully we'll make some advances in the screening, but even on top of that, it is a biologically relatively nasty form of cancer. It doesn't have a lot of these 
actionable mutations, you know, these things that we can do targeted therapies for. So we just need to be better at it. And the last concern about pancreas adenocarcinoma is that, boy, it incidence is skyrocketing so that, that there's discussion that even in the, within the next decade, it will pass breast cancer, prostate cancer, maybe even the lung cancer as being among the most deadly forms of cancer in the United States. So scary, incidence is going up and we need a lot of work in the discovery area, area to really get better in, in managing this. But so I wish I had better news about, about it. Well, we've come a long way though. We've come a long way, but we have a long ways to go. So absolutely. So um, moving on in the interest of time, since we have all of these questions, let me just get to one question that's um, at least a theme that seems to be in a, in a, few, a few of these questions, which is, does every cancer patient abandon MD Anderson have a nurse navigator? So the simple answer is yes. Um, the nurse navigator is probably at your initial visit for some of those that require just a single modality of treatment. Say, for example, if somebody goes in with early stage colon cancer and they see one of our colorectal surgeons and then the colon cancer is early stage, does not require any other further follow-up, the patient doesn't have an ostomy or any of that, and then it's resected and the patient goes home, sees us once a year, those would probably see the nurse navigator once. The ones that absolutely have um, nurse navigators on a regular basis and are very integrally involved, like Sharon mentioned previously, are the ones that require this multi-modality care, wherein multiple specialities are involved. And that is certainly something that we do with every patient that comes here to the cancer center. So another question that uh, seems to uh, come up here is, and I'm going to direct that to you, uh, Dr. Chang. In terms of pancreatic cancer, since Dr. Choti mentioned it was uh, is, is so dismal, and we are having a lot of challenges with regards to that, what are we doing to detect ca uh, pancreatic cancer earlier? So, Dr. Chang, would you like to comment on that? Certainly, Dr. Kinganda. Um... I, there are probably different situations where we can identify pancreatic cancer earlier. Um, one of which is incidental early detection, which is when you come into uh, to an imaging center for a scan for abdominal discomfort, you know, sometimes these cancers are incidentally identified at that time. Um, there are other times where, as Dr. Chody has mentioned, that there are specific screening tests that we can do, even though Currently on the market, nothing is probably excellent, um, which is why people are pushing towards different ways of looking at you know, detecting these cancers early. So Dr. Chody mentioned about uh, circulating tumor DNA. So that's DNA that's released by the cancer cells into the bloodstream. The other aspect where we can identify cancer cells from the bloodstream is um, using identifying circulating tumor cells. So instead of DNA, you identify cells. These are all different possibilities, um, but at least in terms of imaging wise, um, our ability to identify small cancer is difficult to do. The features are very subtle and that's something that we've looked at. And I think if we can use artificial intelligence um, to help us work more efficiently, we might be able to detect that earlier. The other aspect, certainly in terms of blood borne markers, Certainly, I think that there's going to be a lot more research that needs to be done to actually prove that it works as it says. We all, theoretically, it should work. Again, everything that we do in medicine needs to be borne out in a laboratory study, in a, a clinical trial, so that it's proven to be true. Um, and certainly, the, other, the third aspect is we can certainly screen patients with imaging, and people have done that for patients with genetic uh, predispositions to cancer. And those have shown that for patients predisposed to pancreatic cancer, based on their family history, based on their genetics, the imaging with MRI, other than being more invasive, is probably the, the most efficient modality. And the lesions that, that the tumors that we pick up tend to be cystic, um, which 
And we don't exactly know the complete significance of all these lesions yet, as I said, I think more research needs to be done. Thank you, Dr. Chang, that's excellent. I know we are at the end of the hour and I wish we could have gotten to the rest of the questions, but we certainly will um, address all of those and have, that, um, have the answers posted. But with that being said and being respectful to all of, our, all of your time, Banner and B. Anderson, the cancer program would really like to thank you all for helping us do what we do best. That is providing the best cancer care in a comprehensive and coordinated approach. We thank our donors for, uh, to our program. It's your generosity that's really helping us advance this oncological science and we couldn't do it without you. Last but not the least, thank you, Linda, a lot, Krista Hermosio and the Banner Health Foundation for sponsoring this event because we really appreciate the fact that we are able to provide you uh, insight with regards to what we do here on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, the reason why we do what we do is because of our inspiring patients. We are honored that you trust us with your lives and place that trust in us each and every day. Again, thank you very much. Stay safe, watch the program and the follow-up emails and the resource uh, page for this program. We welcome any feedback while we continue to um, continue to uh, continue on with the at home together programming. All right, you guys have a wonderful evening thank and thank you. Bye bye.